Thank you for trusting Texas Children's Hospital with your child's care. The following video is intended to give you more information about your child's diagnosis of Graves' disease and the treatment option available through the radiology department. You probably came into our hospital because you were diagnosed with having an overactive thyroid gland, specifically called hyperthyroidism. So there are many different causes for an overactive thyroid gland, and so our job here in the Department of Pediatric Radiology is to figure out which of the many causes you actually have. So when you came in, you got an imaging study that helped us figure out that the cause for your overactive thyroid gland is from something called Graves' disease. Graves' disease is an autoimmune disorder where your own body is making antibodies that attack and attach to the thyroid gland and effectively always putting it into the on position. You can think of the thyroid gland with Graves' disease as a factory that's always running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And even though your body is telling the thyroid gland to stop production of thyroid hormone because it's making too much, the thyroid gland can no longer be regulated, again, because it's this factory that's always on. There are many different types of treatments for Graves' disease. Specifically, there are three types. One is a medication, and the most common medication to help treat Graves' disease is, is something called methimazole. And so what that does is that helps to decrease the levels of thyroid hormone from a high level down to a normal level. The problems with these drugs is that these drugs oftentimes do not work very well. And it can take a very long time, up to about six months, before the physicians and the patients can figure out it has not worked all that well. Even if the medications do work well, there are a lot of side effects, namely to the liver and to the bone marrow, and so that requires the patients to have to come in regularly for blood draws to make sure that the liver function tests and the bone marrow are still uh, acting normally. So those are the big problems with that type of medication. A second type of treatment is surgery, and so a surgeon can come in and remove the thyroid gland um, and actually help cure the Graves' disease. However, the problem with that is that it's an invasive surgery. A lot of people would prefer to avoid that and it can leave a scar in the area of the neck. But also there are a lot of normal structures in the neck, namely nerves and blood vessels. And you can always have complications to any surgery. You can have an infection, for instance. Okay, a nerve ending or a blood vessel could be cut. Um, so the surgeons would prefer that they not perform a surgery because the third type of treatment that we provide here, the radioactive iodine ablation treatment, is felt to be less invasive and overall felt to be safer and just as effective. So what is radioactive iodine ablation treatment? So it's a very long doctor's name, but effectively what it means is that we would be giving you a medicine and the medicine would go to your thyroid gland and it would kill or ablate the thyroid gland. In and of itself, it will not cure the Graves' disease. Use the analogy of where you have too high of a level of thyroid hormone and we want to bring you down to normal. Once we do our ablation treatment, we're actually going to bring you down where you basically have no thyroid hormone or very little thyroid hormone. That's also very, uh, uh, that's difficult to be living with and that's not a healthy situation. However, we have man-made thyroid hormone that can more easily bring you up to normal levels. Okay, so I do want to stress that even though this type of treatment is part of the cure, it's part of the treatment that will eventually fix the Graves disease, it is only one step, and so you would end up taking man-made thyroid hormone that would eventually allow you to have normal thyroid function and be able to live a normal and happy and healthy life. The radiation is something that we cannot see or smell or touch, and so there's a lot of concern about radiation. So on the one hand, we have discovered that whenever there is radiation of the neck or of the head, that can cause increased incidence of thyroid cancer. So that's been a theoretical concern. We have been performing these studies ever since the 1940s, so we have decades of research and decades of data that talk about the safety of these type of treatments, and we have never noted any increased uh, increased incidence of thyroid cancers secondary to this type of treatment. Frankly, we've not seen any increased incidence of any types of cancers, uh, you know, including leukemia, any of the blood-based cancers, secondary to this type of treatment. This is felt to be a very safe type of procedure. Now, it has been proven, however, that radiation has a very small association with secondary cancers down the road. So how do we deal with that as a society? 
So the way we deal with that is we ensure that somebody only is going to receive radiation if they're going to receive a clinical benefit. So in this setting, you are going to be receiving a clinical benefit because you have Graves' disease and we can help cure your Graves' disease with a very safe and effective treatment. One issue is making sure that patients only get radiation if they derive a benefit. The second way is we make sure that patients only receive the amount of radiation that is necessary to actually fix the problem. So we don't over-radiate somebody, for instance, uh, when it's not necessary. So what we have done with our imaging study is we have calculated in the study when you previously came in and you received a drug, we calculated how much of that drug was taken up by your thyroid gland, and that helps us to determine how much function the thyroid gland is. Based on these numbers, we actually perform a calculation to figure out how much of the radioactive material we give you for the ablation treatment. Even though this treatment procedure has been shown to be very safe uh, and we've not seen any increased risks of secondary cancers to the patients who have received this treatment, in general it is known that radiation does carry a very small associative risk of secondary cancers that can happen later on down the road. Now, your body will be radioactive for a period of time. So we're basically saying that roughly about seven days, your body will have a level of radioactivity in it, and you are therefore able to expose others around you to a certain level of radioactivity. And we wish to minimize that exposure. They're not gonna be getting a clinical benefit that you would be getting because you have Graves' disease, and they do not. So how do we deal with that? So the way that we deal with that is we need to have some knowledge as to how much radiation are we actually giving to a patient and what type of radiation are we giving. All radiation does go down over time. Some radiation goes down in the course of seconds, others are minutes or hours, others days. The half-life for this type of medication we're giving is eight days, which means that every eight days, 50% or half the amount of radiation that we give will have decayed or gone down. Now it's actually a lot higher than the 50% because over the course of roughly one week's time, your body will be excreting a lot of this radiation in the form of urine and sweat as well as uh, stool, bowel movements. Uh, however, your body over the course of the next seven days will have some radiation, will be radioactive. So we want to minimize your exposure to other people. How do we do that? So we have a series of guidelines and a sheet that we will be giving you that will help guide you over the course of this week. So I've already mentioned that a majority of the radioactivity will be excreted from the urine and from the bowel movements, but basically anything that your body makes, the oil on the skin, uh, your tears, your sweat, uh, your sneezes, all of that will have some level of radioactivity for that. So the way that we would manage that is we recommend going to the dollar store and just getting some plastic cups, paper plates, plastic uh, knives, forks, spoons, that sort of thing. And then we ensure that over the course of that week, those cups and those plates are yours. That way you're not co-mingling anything that you're using with the rest of the family. And that way we also don't have an issue where there is maybe a common family water glass, for instance, and everybody's just drinking out that same water glass. If we have a nice red plastic cup, everybody in your family knows that that's your cup and then they leave that alone. The reason why we also recommend uh, purchasing some plastic knives and spoons is we want to avoid you over the course of next week going into the common drawer where all the other silverware is located because even if you're trying to pick up one spoon, you'll probably be touching all the other knives and forks and spoons as well. Uh, so we want to be minimizing that. We want to minimize uh, just in general your uh, the amount of work you do in the kitchen. We don't want you putting your hand into the bread bag, taking out a couple of slices of bread because you'll be touching the bag, you'll be touching other loaves, that sort of thing. Okay. Other things we want to consider is that even though over time the amount of radioactivity in your body will go down, and we're saying for the course of our guidelines about seven days, there's also a concept of distance, that the further away you are from somebody, then the less that anybody around you will be exposed. So we feel that if you're about six feet away from somebody, that person sitting next to you will not be exposed. So that can be a little bit awkward for family time at dinner, but you can still have dinner with your family, but just sit about six feet away. You can still have family movie night, for instance, and so again, it can be a little bit awkward, but just go ahead and sit six feet away. I think that the biggest issue that you will be facing is one of boredom. So I think that uh, prior to uh, beginning our treatment procedure, you should think ahead and think about going ahead and getting your schoolwork from the school because we don't want you going to school, for instance, because you would just be sitting next to a classmate for eight hours during the day. So you're going to be staying at the house. 
uh, you're going to be uh, not having as much access to your friends and siblings as you might like. And so we need to make sure there are ways, books, games, family movie night, maybe have a fun uh, unbirthday celebration and so on a particular, you know, uh, mid portion of the week you have a big cake and you have a big celebration. Do little fun uh, things as a family to go ahead and make the, the week go on. So we've already discussed the issues of time and distance and specifically focused on the areas of the kitchen. It's preferable if you can be granted your own bathroom. Now you are able to share a bathroom with somebody. Um, it's a little bit more challenging, but it can be done. But it's certainly easier if you have your own bathroom. That way you don't have to worry about sharing towels. You don't have to worry about the toothbrush that you're using, the bristles on that toothbrush touching somebody else's toothbrush. It's just simply much easier that way. If you do end up sharing a bathroom, then I would recommend getting a towel that is very obvious. It's the pink polka dot towel. It is the brand new towel that, nobody, that everybody knows is going to be yours. It's the old towel with holes in it, but just something that's very distinctive. And so then nobody will take that towel. And that is going to be the bathroom you use, and those are the towels you'll use. So for instance, don't be using the kitchen towel when you come in from the outside to wash and dry your hands. Always go in and use that one towel. It's also preferable that you have your own room to sleep in because if you're sharing a room, and a lot of siblings do share a room, but then you may just be irradiating one of your siblings for eight hours during the night. And again, your sibling's not getting any benefit from that radiation. In terms of washing the clothes, we recommend to just go ahead and not mix any of your clothes, don't mix any of your bed sheets, don't mix any of your towels with the rest of the family's laundry for that one week period. The way that we think about radiation is again time and distance. So we have the time is seven days and distance for about six feet away. So really after seven days you can go ahead and take all the clothes, take all the bed linens, take all the towels and you can wash them. You do not need to wash all of these items multiple times. They're not like it's soiled. These are just radioactivity and poof after seven days all that radioactivity is gone. You're not going to be ruining your clothes washer by putting these linens and clothing into the clothes washer, but just go ahead and keep them separate for one week period of time. And it's going to be the same thing for the trash. So I would go ahead and create a separate trash bag for all the paper plates and plastic cups and just hold on to that for one week. And then after one week, they can go out to the rest of the city garbage like everything else. I'd like for you not to go and make long car trips. Do not leave Houston and drive to San Antonio, for instance. That's a three and a half hour drive and you're just going to be sitting next to a family member uh, for that time period. We don't want you going out to the movies because then you're just going to be sitting next to somebody rating them for two and a half hours. We do not want you to be going to school for seven hours for the same reason. You'll be sitting next to one of your classmates and irradiating them for a total of eight hours. Now I do want to stress that a little bit of exposure to others is not a problem and I would even say that if you are sitting next to somebody uh, watching a movie if they're only a few feet away it's probably not a problem. However, because of the very low association of radiation with secondary cancers, there is an emotional component to this. And you can imagine the problems that might occur if a classmate is exposed to you in school and the concerns that those parents might have. So we do wish to stress that we do wish to have you minimize your exposure to the public. It's going to be potentially very boring to be at home for a total of seven days. So we want to minimize you're going out with family members to the grocery store and even going shopping. And you might think that that would not be exciting, but after you've been at home alone for three days, going to the grocery store might actually be fun for you. And we'd like for you to minimize doing that. Same thing with minimizing going out onto any public transportation, any uh, subways or um, any trains or uh, buses. Close contacts with infants or pregnant women should be avoided during the seven day period. And all patients of childbearing age, we do ask that they uh, undergo a urine pregnancy test to ensure that they are not pregnant at the time of receiving this ablation therapy procedure. For a fetus, the fetus has a developing thyroid gland and that developing thyroid gland, it is possible that if a patient is pregnant at the time of the procedure, the medication can cross the placenta and the fetus can actually take up the medication and can ablate their thyroid gland. And as they're developing, the thyroid gland is very important for the development of the brain and if there's no thyroid hormone, then you can actually have mental retardation. So these are very serious concerns that we have and that's why we do ask to not have any exposure with pregnant women or be pregnant at the time of these procedures. In terms of infants and young children, we just simply ask to minimize exposure, don't give hugs or kisses to very young children and try and have slightly uh, greater thresholds for separation 
uh, than for older children and adults. I do want to stress that these are guidelines. These are not black and white rules. So this is not an issue of if you follow guidelines one, two, and three, but you have some difficulty with number four, it's not the end of the world. If it was not safe for you to be able to go home uh, after getting this treatment, then we would not allow you to do so. This is a perfectly safe procedure. And the goal is all about minimizing exposure of yourself to others. It's not about removing it entirely. If we are successful with this initial treatment, remember that I'm not actually bringing you down to a normal value. I'm actually ablating or killing your thyroid gland, and so you're either going to have underactive or low levels of thyroid hormone or no thyroid hormone levels at all. This is also a not healthy situation. So you will be needing to go back to your endocrinologist who will be prescribing you man-made thyroid hormone. It's called Synthroid. And so you'll be taking this medication every day for the rest of your life. And this type of medication more easily is able to bring you up to normal thyroid hormone levels. It's very difficult with the medicines that we have to bring somebody at a high level down to a normal level, but it is relatively easy to bring somebody up from a very low level up to a normal level. However, this will require a relationship with your endocrinologist for the course of your life, and you may be checking in every few years or so just to go ahead and make sure that your thyroid hormone levels are at the appropriate level, because as all of our bodies change as we mature, our bodies will require more or less of that type of drug. This is a very short and quick treatment. If should you decide to have the treatment performed today, we can certainly accommodate your schedule. We would be bringing in a cart that would actually contain the medicine. Um, and in this cart, we would simply have a straw. You drink the medicine out of a very small volume of liquid, and you just drink it out of a straw. Um, and overall, it would probably take less than 10 minutes to have the treatment performed. Scheduling for these treatments is very flexible. We work with your schedule. You do not necessarily have to work with ours. And sometimes it can be difficult depending upon the family situation at home, if both parents are working or dependent upon how many uh, siblings or what types of siblings, the age of the siblings at home, it can be very challenging to go ahead and schedule these treatments. And then there's also school because some patients, uh, the patients will need to stay out of school for a course of seven days, and there may be some exams that are coming up that are problematic. So it is, from a medical perspective, it is very safe if you choose to delay uh, performance of the treatment, you want to go ahead and wait a few days, you want to wait a few weeks, that is all perfectly appropriate and you will not be damaging the thyroid gland or making the symptoms worse. Again, we work with your schedule. However, should you desire to get treated today, we can also perform that. Radiologists would come in and discuss with you the consent form and if you consent to the procedure, we would order the medicine from a local pharmacy it would probably takes about two to three hours for that medicine to come back to us. And so at that point, we would send you to go off and have lunch. You can have a normal lunch without any restrictions. You would return to us and we would perform the treatment. We do start to already see some effects within the first few weeks, but the overall length of treatment can take several months. So it may actually take up to about six months before you notice a genuine improvement in your symptoms. In some patients, it's even as much as one year. We hope you feel more informed about your child's diagnosis and the treatment options. Your physician will be in shortly to answer any questions you may have.